One of the people the Lord put in my life was a theology professor named John Frame, who defined theology as the application of God's word to all areas of life. I think that fits with what we're doing here. I know this is an after dinner talk, but I also know you're interested in theology and work. Theology is work, <laughs> and that's what I want to talk about tonight, the work we all do as theologians. So I hope you've had a nice supper and that you're ready to get to work. My topic is learning Christ. Once upon a time, people thought that education was the surest way to get ahead. Once upon a time, people thought that going to college was a no-brainer. Once upon a time, people thought they had to go to seminary to become a pastor. All those times are past. People doubt the value uh, today of a liberal arts or a seminary education. Young people wonder whether it might be better to play the Monopoly card that directs them to go, do not pass tests, do not collect a degree, go directly into the ministry. And things have changed in the academy, too. Christian scholars have not fully appreciated that we're in the midst of an epistemological crisis that makes integrating faith and learning, faith and discipleship even harder. The changes in society and the academy are also being felt in seminaries. And they're also being felt in the very way we read the Bible. I have a pet theory. Let me share it with you. Be gentle with it, because it is my pet theory. <laughs> but, but here it is. I think there's no more telling intellectual or cultural barometer as to what's going on in society these days than biblical interpretation. Now, James, in his epistle, says we ought to see ourselves as we really are in the mirror of Scripture. But all too often, the Bible becomes a mirror in which we see our own passions and preoccupations. We see what we want to see. I believe that every social trend, every academic fashion, eventually shows up either in the way we read Scripture or in what we pay attention to in Scripture. Just think about it. There are whole commentary series now given over to uh, social movements like feminism, post-colonialism, Marxism, and so on. All of these movements that have made their impact felt in culture have their champions in biblical studies and the way people write commentaries. Now, some of these approaches are very helpful to the extent that they illumine aspects of scripture we wouldn't have paid attention to ourselves. But the trend is worrisome because not all of these interests correspond to what is actually in the biblical text. Now, Christian scholars, especially those in seminaries working with scripture, need to approach their scholarship not simply as socially conditioned readers, because culture is always forming us and our interests. Christian scholars have a special obligation not to approach scripture like everybody else, but to read as saints, people set apart, for a specific purpose, people set apart as disciples, people called not just to investigate the word or do an autopsy on it, but to follow the word written that points us to the word of life. What I want to talk about tonight is what it means to be disciples in our academic disciplines. In particular, what does discipleship look like in the theological disciplines? It may seem like an odd question, but I hope by the end of my talk, it won't seem that odd. The biblical text on which I'd like to reflect and under which I want to stand tonight and for the rest of my life is Ephesians 4, starting at verse 17. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. And then verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, 
verse 23, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. There's an important contrast here between a darkened and an enlightened understanding. And the difference between the two is whether or not we have learned Christ, a lesson that renews the mind. The pursuit of higher theological education is the story of my life. I wanted to be a scholar and a disciple. I went to Cambridge University with one question in mind. What does it mean to be biblical? In theology, in life, in everyday discipleship, what does it mean to be biblical? At the time, British academic theology was very much under the sway of modernity. And that meant I had a problem. I had to solve the problem of how to do theology in the first place in a way that modernity would find acceptable. I had to spell out the conditions for the very possibility of doing theology. And all the theologians that I was studying with seemed to have alliance, alliances with other disciplines, uh, perhaps to give theology a kind of intellectual respectability, sometimes just to find a method. It didn't take me too long before I latched onto hermeneutics as my helping discipline. Because hermeneutics is not just confined to the study of scripture, it's a respectable study in the university. So surely the way to be biblical, or we might say to be textual, was to find the right hermeneutic, the right theory of interpretation. So I hitched my wagon to the latest and most chic theory to come out of Paris at the time, Paul Ricoeur's hermeneutical philosophy. And I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the merits of reading the Gospels with Ricoeur's narrative hermeneutics. It even got published, Biblical Narrative and the Philosophy of Paul Ricoeur. But in the process of working on this assignment, I eventually came to realize that I had let something non-theological into the hermeneutical driver's seat, something that if I allowed it to keep directing me, might lead me to veer off the road of orthodoxy. And so that was when I began to ask myself if I was being a scholar, uh, sorry, of being a disciple in the academy. I began to ask myself whether my convictions about reading the Bible were theological all the way down. In other words, it wasn't enough that I was studying theology. The question was, was I studying it in the right way? So I hope that what it does mean to study it in the right way will become clear in the next few minutes. Now, you all probably know that there is no such thing as the department of from Bible to theology. Christian colleges and divinity schools typically have separate departments for Old Testament, New Testament, church history, systematic theology, and other things. Other things like evangelism, preaching, counseling, education, and missions, all of which we could put under the rubric practical theology if we stretch it. What is now the default fourfold curriculum of theological education was developed by Friedrich Schleiermacher, the father of modern liberal theology in 19th century University of Berlin. The aim of that curriculum was to prepare pastors for their profession. It was a professional training program. That fourfold model draws and quarters the body of theology into different members, different areas of specialization that, like Humpty Dumpty, are hard to put back together again. But from Bible to theology, or from Bible to discipleship, nevertheless expresses the mandate of theological education. We have to help form students who can understand God's word so that they can achieve godliness and live out the citizenship of the gospel. Theology serves the church, after all, in this project of making disciples, people who aren't simply interested in theoretical understanding, but when they get understanding, they're able to live it out as wise and faithful witnesses to the truth of Jesus Christ. Education should involve what the Germans call Bildung, formation of students, people who are mature in Christ. So how are we doing as theological educators? I want to begin by taking the measure of the problem, 
the fragmentation of theological education into these distinct silos of theological knowledge. And then next I'll suggest that understanding is the proper end of theology, that biblical interpretation is the means to that end, and that we have to interpret scripture in a way that accords with its nature, its subject matter, its ultimate interest, and its final purpose, all of which are theological and have to do with making disciples. Because the ultimate aim is to learn Christ. And I believe that this requires a properly theological approach to the task of biblical interpretation, where we're not simply learning information, but we're forming and transforming people who can follow the biblical words in order to follow the living word. Then I'm going to come back to this fourfold curricular division and suggest that each department in the seminary uh, academy plays a vital role interpreting the Bible theologically and in helping students to learn Christ. And then I'll conclude by suggesting that discipleship is perhaps the most important form of biblical interpretation there is. So more to the problem then, uh, secularization. Just last week, I spoke at a conference on radical Christian scholarship at Houston Baptist University. The premise was that integration of faith and learning isn't happening in our Christian schools because a picture of scholarship holds us captive. You see, most people who are getting PhDs in secular universities are taught to approach their subject matters with naturalistic assumptions. That is, they assume that reality is this worldly and that the best way to understand reality is with this worldly methods. The intellectual culture of naturalism forms Christian scholars to think along certain paths, paths that eventually became, become ruts. And when they get a job in a Christian college, they're asked to integrate the approach they've learned, this secular approach, with their subject and to do this in faith. Faith may influence what a scholar studies, but not necessarily the way a scholar studies the subject. In other words, integration seems now, in retrospect, since we've been doing this for some 50 years, integration seems to cede too much territory to the opposition. Just as in my doctoral studies, I let Paul Ricoeur's hermeneutical uh, theory into the driver's seat, and it began to dictate my conclusions. So at this conference, it was suggested that what we need is a radical Christian approach, radical in the sense of going back to the root of things, that reflects on one subject matter with Christian faith from the get-go, not with naturalistic assumptions. Now, you may be thinking, isn't he at the wrong dinner talk? What does this have to do with discipleship in the workplace? Um, I can see how integration might be a problem for a historian or a liter literary critic or a biologist, but, but surely not for a seminary professor. We don't have to worry about integration, right? Well, if you're thinking that, I'd encourage you to think again. Because our educational system has also been influenced from the larger academy and society. Point two, specialization. One symptom that this is happening, the extent to which seminary professors have been affected by the secular academy is specialization. In most institutions of higher education, specialists have greater academic status than generalists. We reward and revere experts. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for specialists. I appreciate the monographs they write. Specialists are often the pioneers that go further and deeper, who make life-saving discoveries in medicine and so forth. But the place of specialization in seminary may be another matter. It's linked to another formative process that we've taken over from the secular academy, and that is professionalization. Remember, this was the driving vision behind Schleiermacher's restructuring of the university in Berlin. By the way, I'm using, I'm using Asian words, secularization, professionalization, all those Asian words describe a process. And I suggest to you they describe a process of spiritual formation. 
They have to do with the hidden curriculum that we inadvertently teach. So to the extent that we think of ourselves as professionals or specialists, what are we saying about theological education? The danger in thinking of oneself as a professional is that one begins to think of one's work in terms of career rather than vocation. And as Eugene Peterson says brilliantly in his book, Under the Unpredictable Plant, careers are about making our name great, but a vocation is about making God's name great. Disciples have vocations, they don't have careers. And then finally, fragmentation. In spite of the obvious benefit of specialized knowledge in other fields, Edward Farley, a theologian from Vanderbilt, and others have bewailed its unintended effects in theological education, especially disciplinary fragmentation. Edward Farley says, theologia, theology, uh, not that belongs to one discipline, but the whole enterprise of coming to understand God. Theologia no longer forms part of a theological school's conception of its course of study. And he says the result is a loss of unifying subject matter. Instead of a common subject matter, which would be God, theological education tends to focus on acquiring a skill set or a knowledge base deemed necessary to becoming a pastor, to be having that kind of profession. There's a real danger here of a confusing knowledge of God with acquiring skills or amassing information. So I think a lot of seminary students can relate to T.S. Eliot's woeful plaint, where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Because we are indeed awash in information. Of the storing of megabytes, there is no end. But is education simply a matter of data transfer? More to the point, are pastors specialists or professionals? I've argued elsewhere that secularization has infected the church in a place where we might least expect it, the pulpit. That is our understanding of what a pastor is and does. Pastors are often seen to be professionals or perhaps specialists in things like worship, youth ministry, or congregational life. Where is the wisdom we have lost in strategic plans? This then is our problem as theological educators, and I think we may need a new paradigm to train pastor theologians, people who have learned Christ and who can teach Christ to others. Let me pick on my own discipline now, lest you think that this talk is a subtle ploy to reinstate systematic theology as the queen of the seminary sciences. I've already confessed to you how, as a doctoral student, I had a certain status anxiety about my discipline and looked for ways to hitch my theological wagon to a philosophical star so that I could receive Cambridge University's seal of intellectual approval. The late John Webster, also at Cambridge, though a few years ahead of me, had a very similar experience. He said it took him years to unlearn how to do theology after Cambridge, but eventually he came to see that it was a matter of using the resources of Christian faith itself, scripture, tradition, instead of some helping discipline like hermeneutics. And he came to practice what he called theological theology. And that name was a slap in the face to his Oxford colleagues because it implied they were doing non-theological theology. And Webster came to see that, that human intelligence and everything that reason does uh, has to be seen theologically because human intelligence is created. Let me quote him here. He says, we have to detach ourselves from the assumption that the natural life of creatures is a secular life, cordoned off from God's presence and action. All of life is lived quorum Deu, before the creator God. There is no such thing as secularity. So everything we do as Christian scholars is part of a triune economy, an economy of light from the God who is light through Christ who is the light of the world 
to the Spirit who sheds the light of Christ abroad in our hearts. Christian scholarship is part of this great economy of light. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Because theology, as a discipline in the university at least, is subject to the same forces of naturalization and secularization as any other discipline, including biblical studies. I want that to sink in, because it's a sobering thought, not least because a good number of our seminary professors get their PhDs from secular universities. Take Charles Hodge's approach to theological method in 19th century Princeton. He says, the Bible is to the theologian what nature is to the man of science. It is his storehouse of facts. And for Hodge, we move from the Bible to theology inductively, because that's how science was done in the 19th century. Scripture gives us the information. Theology theorizes it, explains how these facts relate to one another. So he says, the Bible contains the truth, which the theologian collects, authenticates, arranges, and exhibits in its internal relation. And doctrines, the sum total of what the Bible says about God, can then be arranged a little bit like butterflies pinned in so many display cabinets, that is, theology textbooks. In other words, on this view, theology is a kind of information processing, and education is a delivery system that, like FedEx, guarantees the timely arrival of its packets of information. Is this process of going from Bible to theology to discipleship as linear as it sounds? And how, apart are the, how far apart are these things? You see, back to the fragmentation of the disciplines, the distance that people think separate biblical studies from theology is a, is a common theme, starting with Lessing's famous ugly ditch uh, through J.P. Gopler's 1787 lecture on the distinction between biblical and dogmatic theology to Kirster Stendhal's 20th century distinction between what it meant and what it means. What it meant is for the Bible scholar, what it means is for the theologian. These are all different ways of describing an, a dichotomy at the heart of the seminary curriculum. What is clear about the seminary curriculum is that a fissure runs through it. One way of describing this fissure signaled by the tense of Stendhal's verbs, meant means, is the distance between past and present. Again, some people think biblical scholarship describes the past, what those authors thought then about God, and then theology recasts those past formulations into terms that people could understand in the present. Another way of thinking about it, the difference would be academy versus church. Biblical scholars are often very concerned not to read later theology back into the biblical text. But in principle, even persons without faith can say what it meant. That is, they can report on what Israelites and Christians respectively thought about God back then. But theologians read scripture, at least they're supposed to, from within a confessional tradition as the word of God. And this tension between not importing theology back and reading as Christians has led at least one scholar to contrast what he calls the academic Bible with the Christian scripture. Should disciples be reading the academic Bible or the Christian scripture? Learning how to read the Bible, rightly handling the word of truth, is arguably one of the most important things a seminary has to teach. So are we teaching the academic Bible or the Christian scripture? We want our students, to read with uh, our students to read with understanding, but what kind of understanding? Let me suggest that the Bible is both like and unlike any other text. It's like every other book because it has human authors who say something about something in some way. It's unlike any other book because first, it has God as its ultimate author, it has God the Son, Jesus Christ, as its ultimate content, and it has God, the Holy Spirit, for its ultimate interpreter. And then finally, it has the church as its ultimate interpretive community. This movement then from Bible to theology, which is at the heart of discipleship, 
ultimately calls for nothing less than a distinctly theological way of interpreting, a way of interpreting that corresponds to the Bible's nature, function, and purpose as God's word. So I suggest, and this is radical in some quarters, I have to tell you, I suggest that the goal of theological interpretation is not simply to say what it meant, but rather to hear and obey God's living and active word speaking in and through scripture to the church today. The goal of theological interpretation is not merely to learn to read the Bible, it is to learn Christ. Theology has been called faith search for understanding, understanding first and foremost of the Bible. But understanding involves more than knowing discrete bits of information. It has to do with grasping how those bits of information fit together and then knowing what to do about it. And understanding scripture ultimately involves seeing how all things fit together or are summed up in Jesus Christ. This is what Paul says is the goal of God's plan in Ephesians 1, 2. And this also is a component of what it means to learn Christ, to learn how all things are summed up in Christ. To learn Christ is to discover what God has done for us and our salvation. To understand how all things fit together in Christ is therefore to understand nothing less than the God of the gospel and the gospel of God. So that's one thing I want to say about understanding. It has to do with grasping how things fit together and how those things fit together in Christ. But secondly, understanding has a practical di dimension. It's a kind of following. We talk about following stories or following arguments. And to attain faith's understanding, we have to do both. We have to follow the story that scripture tells, the arguments that are laid out, and the person at its heart. We follow the biblical story from creation through cruci crucifixion to consummation. And it's important to know how the biblical parts fit into a canonical whole. That's also biblical understanding. We follow the apostolic arguments about the significance of Jesus' work and its implications. And then we follow the person of Jesus by walking his way of truth and life. It's surely more than a coincidence that the New Testament Greek term for disciple, mathetes, is connected to the New Testament term for learning, uh, manthano. I think it's more than a coincidence that the Latin root of disciple is connected to the academic term for discipline. Learning scripture is ultimately a futile exercise, you see, if it doesn't lead to discipleship. It's not just because of the etymology, either. So here's my thesis at least one of my first theses. Biblical interpretation is a form of discipleship, and discipleship is a form of biblical interpretation. That's why I'm spending so much time on biblical interpretation. The way we interpret the Bible, the manner in which we do it, the conclusions we come to, all of this falls under discipleship. Whether or not a person truly understands God's word is ultimately demonstrated not by final exams, but it's demonstrated in practice. Can a person rightly use scripture for training in righteousness, for cultivating godliness, and for becoming Christ-like? So I hope you see by now that faith-seeking understanding involves much more than processing and storing information. The, vi the vital test of the Christian life is not multiple choice, but fill in the blank the blank being the span of one's life. Charles Wood has said that one's understanding is one's abilities, and the measure of one's abilities is the exercise of them. We know if we understand if we're able to walk after these words as we ought. Seminaries then exist to foster biblical literacy and theological understanding, to help people learn Christ to follow the way the biblical words go in order to follow Jesus. So a little bit about learning, a little bit about paideia, and a little bit about wisdom. According to the medieval scholastic adage, theology teaches of God, is taught by God, and leads to God. 
Jesus taught that no one knows of God the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And after he says this, he then says to the disciples, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. To take Jesus' yoke is to adopt his way. It's a figure of speech for becoming his disciple. And education from Bible to theology is ultimately about learning how to live as his disciples, citizens of the gospel. Educated disciples know how to glorify God in everyday life. I want to learn how to do that. Again, the modern academy privileges a different kind of knowledge, a knowledge that can be quantified and made theoretical. But when Paul says, this is not the way you learned Christ, he's referring to uh, acting as those with darkened understanding behave. He's saying that learning about Jesus is not the same thing as learning Christ. Learning Christ involves more than memorization or inductive knowledge. The goal in learning Christ is not simply knowing more things, it's understanding and then demonstrating that understanding in practice. Calvin's commentary on Ephesians 4.20, my key verse, highlights the special kind of learning that's in view. Calvin says, he whose life differs not from that of unbelievers has learned nothing of Christ. For the knowledge of Christ cannot be separated from the mortification of the flesh. And then he goes on and Paul goes on and specifies how the Ephesians did learn Christ. He says, you have heard about him and were taught in him. F.F. F. Bruce thinks that to be taught in Christ means being taught in the context of Christian fellowship. And the contrast is with those who try to learn about Jesus outside the sphere of his influence. But the contrast is clear and decisive. Christ has transformed the Ephesians' pattern of perception and habits of thinking and feeling such that they now know the truth and can take every thought captive to Christ. Luke 6, 40 says, a disciple, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now I'm moving on to Paideia. Learning to read the Bible in order to follow Christ requires, as I've been saying, more than the transformation or transmission of information. The teacher isn't a cog in a delivery system, but a guide whose task is to develop a student's capacity to follow the words of Scripture in order to learn Christ and to do Christ. Again, this involves more than the recall of information. I think it involves the ability to make judgments. Let me suggest that the classroom is primarily a place not to transfer information, but to learn how to process it and respond to it. It's a place where students are formed in right judgment making. By judgment, I mean a very basic mental or moral act, such as identifying something as a something, or making a distinction, this is not that, or making a connection. Judging is part and parcel of discernment because disciples are constantly having to distinguish, for example, what is godly from what is not ungodly. We have to make judgments all the time, and that involves more than processing information. Theological education, I suggest, should press in here, helping students to understand and make judgments. And again, understanding how everything fits together helps. Uh, so to understand the Bible is to know how all its parts fit together, how Christ is at the center, and where we fit in the story as well. What I'm getting at is the difference between Wissenschaft and Paideia, between Berlin, scientific knowledge, and Athens, practical wisdom. Paideia, we get our word pedagogy from this Greek term. It has to do not with learning an academic specialization, but with the formation of the whole person. I think it has to do with helping people to become people who can make judgments, discerning judgments on the basis of God's word. Scripture is profitable for teaching and training paideia in righteousness, 2 Timothy 
That's a, such an important verse, I think, for this project. Scripture is profitable for training paideia in righteousness. And I would say this about Christian doctrine as well. Doctrine isn't an end in itself. It's a pedagogical tool. It helps people to make right judgments. It helps disciples to become discerning people. Calvin's Institutes were written for this practical purpose. Uh, his biographer says, for Calvin, discipleship is paideia, formative education. And he wrote his Institutes to help his readers become more effective readers of scripture. Learning to read scripture theologically is the primordial form of Christian discipleship. This is what I think theological education should aim at, helping disciples to read scripture in order to learn how to discern what is fitting and how things fit together in Christ. This involves uh, uh, training our faculties to distinguish good from evil, as Hebrews 5.14 puts it. Again, we need to know more than bits of information. That's a trivial pursuit. We need to know how to make sound judgments about things that matter, especially judgments about the form our discipleship should take here and now. Scripture is the disciples' royal pedagogical road to knowledge of God. Rightly to read the Bible means achieving a kind of canonical competence. Students should become apprentices of Scripture. This is one way we learn how to read Scripture. Uh, David Starling has written a new book entitled Hermeneutics as Apprenticeship, Allowing the Bible to Shape Our Interpretive Habits and Practices. I wish I had had that at Cambridge. Students also become our apprentices. And that's a sobering thought as well, particularly if they learn to do what we do and not what we say. We have to be disciples in the classroom in order to teach others. Learning Christ is a matter of putting on or practicing Christ because it's by reading God's word constantly, illuminated by the spirit, that we come to have the mind of Christ ourselves. I think that means that we learn how to think rightly, to see, judge, and act rightly, that is in a Christ-like manner, by becoming saturated in the scriptures. Scripture offers precious remedial training to darkened hearts and clouded minds. And I think by reading scripture, we come to see reality as it truly is. We come to see ourselves as we truly are, and this is why I think Calvin refers to scripture as the spectacles of faith. It corrects our vision so we begin to see things correctly. It's the oculus that enables us to experience not virtual but eschatological reality, the real as it is coming to be in Christ. In other words, scripture restores us to our senses so that we can see, hear, and taste the goodness of God. People without scripture don't have a taste for that. So it's, becoming, it's by becoming apprentices to scripture uh, that uh, we learn the mind of Christ. And then wisdom. Knowing how to read the Bible to learn Christ and to learn Christ in order to read the Bible requires biblical literacy, canonical competence, excellence in interpretation. Yes, but it begins with the fear of the Lord. It requires wisdom, the beginning of which is knowing God as creator and oneself as creature. The wise person flourishes because he or she lives in harmony with the created order and the new created order in Christ. I want to teach wisdom. There's this question, can wisdom be taught? I don't know what you think about that, but that's what I'm after in the classroom. I want to teach my students to know what to do in particular situations in order to follow Christ and glorify God. I want them to learn how to be disciples. I want them to learn how to embody the mind of Christ to everyone, everywhere, at all times. I think that's a thick description of what it means to learn Christ. <clears throat> 
So I'm saying that scripture helps us to see the world as it is. Uh, it's the spectacles of faith. And when we have these spectacles of faith on, says Calvin, we see the world as God's most beautiful theater. We see God's presence and activity in our world. And elsewhere, I've developed this theatrical model. Some might say overdeveloped it and argued that theological wisdom is essentially a matter of discerning the drama that we're in and knowing what we as actors should do to play our parts well. Discipleship, you see, I think, requires a readiness to improvise with our canonical script, ready to act out our part in the drama of redemption before anyone, anywhere, at all times. But the aim and this is where scripture helps us, the aim is to discern what discipleship means and requires of us where we are in particular situations. Calvin, one scholar says, sees all theological knowledge as coming down to savoir faire, savoir faire, the knowledge of what to do, know-how. Uh, the Greek term is phronesis, practical reason. In particular, it's the knack of knowing how to act out the life of Christ in whatever scene we happen to be playing. Okay, point three. There is no single department of from Bible to theology. I don't think we should think of from Bible to theology as a progressive dinner from one department to the next either. So how should we think about these four traditional seminary disciplines? Well, here's my, another thesis, thesis number two. Theological interpretation of scripture is not a new specialization. It's not a new discipline. It's rather a joint enterprise of all the theological disciplines working together to understand God's word to the church yesterday and today. I'm arguing that our goal, you see, is not to produce specialists in these departments, know-it-alls about small things, but rather disciples who know one big thing, namely how to follow Jesus and live out with others their citizenship of the gospel, joyfully, cheerfully, and competently uh, at all times. So from Bible to theology is not another disciplinary specialization. It's a call to interdisciplinary cooperation. Our seminary departments should not imitate Jesus' disciples who argued among themselves who was the greatest. No one discipline sits at the Lord's right hand. Each is a gift to the church. Each contributes a distinct perspective on this living and active word of God. The various academic disciplines in a seminary are organically connected, and each is a properly theological study. Each is a properly theological study. My discipline has an adjectival qualifier. It's systematic theology. But that's not the whole of theology. All the disciplines are involved in this theological project of reading scripture to know God. And at its best, interdepartmental cooperation should be the lifeblood of a seminarian's education. But it can be that only if the Holy Spirit staves off spiritual anemia, and the other vices that tend to keep the disciplines separate. I think it takes not a village, but a whole seminary faculty working together in the partnership of the gospel to help students learn Christ. And as we're meeting at Trinity, let me quote Herman Bovink about the doctrine of the Trinity. He says, the mind of the Christian is not satisfied until every form of existence has been referred to the triune God. And I think this also applies to the biblical text and the process of its interpretation. We ought not to be satisfied with our biblical interpretations until we refer them to the triune God. So I want now to provide a brief sketch of how we might be able to do that with each of the four departments, starting with biblical studies. The Bible is supremely authoritative because it has God as its ultimate author. It has divine say-so, sola scriptura. We're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation this year. Sola scriptura, sing it with me. But it doesn't follow that the Bible belongs to biblical studies only. 
to the Old and New Testament departments. In fact, biblical studies, like non-theological theology, has also, to a large extent, been secularized. This happens when scholars like Benjamin Jowett read the Bible like any other book, which is the title of a very famous essay he wrote. To read the Bible like any other book with a general hermeneutic is to fail to do justice to the kind of thing it is. It's an ingredient in God's economy of revelation, a semantic photon in the economy of light. It's not enough to read the Bible as evidence of the history of Israel or of early Christianity. Any secular scholar can do that. But for the past 200 years, biblical scholars have tended to treat the biblical text as having a natural history only. And here we do well to recall something John Webster said. He says, for the regenerate intellect, there are no secular studies, because there is nothing which is not to be traced back to God as its principle. Where is radical Christian scholarship when you need it? I know it's tempting to think of the Old and New Testament departments as more biblical than other departments in the curriculum. I've had that discussion uh, several times. I think it's mistaken. And the error lies in thinking that the meaning of the text is a function wholly of its grammar and original historical context. That you get to the bottom of it by asking, what did the author mean in saying what he said at the time? Uh, I think that's not a sufficient account. Learning the, about the world behind the biblical text is frequently illuminating, often indispensable for understanding what's being said, but it's less helpful sometimes for discerning the bigger picture into which all these words fit, or for understanding what those words are talking about the referent of biblical discourse. Biblical interpretation isn't a subset of classics. The goal isn't simply to recover the world behind the text, whether the ancient Near East or Greece or Rome. The aim is to hear God's word speaking in the scripture to us today. And rightly to follow the way the biblical words go, yes, it does require us to do justice to the sense of the text, that they had in their immediate historical context. But there are other contexts. There's the broader redemptive historical context. There's the canonical context. And sometimes it's only by taking those other contexts into account that we can read the Bible as Christians, as Trinitarian Christians. So don't get me wrong. Biblical exegetes make a significant and indispensable contribution in helping us understand the Bible's sense, what is said. But we need other types of theologians to help us make sense of what the biblical authors were talking about, the reference. The nature of the Bible itself requires more than biblical studies. And again, remember, the Bible is God's address to the church. The Bible is not primarily an inert object of investigation. It is a phenomenon that we engage with. It is the living word of God. No other texts lay claim to divine authorship. No other texts demand to be read in redemptive historical context with Christ at the center. No other texts summon their readers to participate rightly in that ongoing history of redemption. Church history. It's been said that church history especially the development of doctrine, is the history of biblical interpretation. In this sense, church history is an answer to prayer. Paul's prayer to the Ephesians, for the Ephesians, that they would comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God in Christ. I do believe that studying the history of Christianity is a way to learn Christ. Much of what we know about Christ, we've learned from others. Paul says in Colossians 2, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught. Tradition is both the process and the content of handing down the faith to others through the generations. Also, historical theology provides extremely valuable lessons in how previous generations 
uh, worked out their discipleship, made judgments about what they had to say and do in their context in order to be faithful disciples. Just think of the Council of Nicaea. What does it mean to be a faithful disciple in the fourth century when some people are saying the Son of God is a creature? What does discipleship look like in fourth century Nicaea? Well, we know the answer to that if you read church history. The term Trinity is not in the Bible per se, but those at Nicaea in the early church realized they had to confess the deity of the Son in order to make sense of what the Bible says about Jesus. The confession that the Son is homoousios with the Father of the same substance, that's a doctrinal development that far from deviating from the Bible, allowed fourth century interpreters to follow the words to their ultimate referent. The history of the church's interpretation of the Bible is thus a history of discipleship, much of it faithful. And then systematic theology, my discipline, often misconstrued and maligned as a form of abstract speculation that is further from the Bible than exegesis, although my usual response to that is, but I'm closer to God. <laughs> it's sometimes suggested that uh, whereas biblical scholars follow the historical order of the Bible, there are other types of order dictated by logic or some other ism that dominate systems of theology. Now look, I need to be honest here. There are pathological systematic theologians. There are people who have let their thought be captive to some philosophy, whether it be Heidegger or even Nietzsche. But at its best, systematic theology is every bit as biblical as Old and New Testament exegesis to the extent that it cares about rendering the same biblical judgments in different conceptual terms. That's what was happening at Nicaea. They were rendering the same biblical judgments as to who Jesus was in the terms that were available to them at the time. Theology is systematic because there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, Paul says in Ephesians 4. So things have to fit together. There's one overarching story of God's gracious promise that comes to fruition in Christ. There's unity there. And systematic theology ex explicates that plan and the planner of salvation, the red thread that holds everything together. And the coherence that characterizes systems of theology is really a function of the oikonomia of God, the execution in history of a plan devised before the foundations of the world. The task of systematic theology is to probe deeper into this plan, into this drama of redemption that has been enacted in history. And exegesis is incomplete until you spell out the ontological implications of the Bible's reference. Only then do interpreters fully understand what we're talking about, and only then do interpreters fully understand the judgments the biblical authors make. Systematic theology clarifies these basic biblical judgments and then tries to reformulate them in terms that people in the church today can understand. The task then is not to be unbiblical, to say something else, but it's rather to render the same biblical judgments in fresh ways. That's the way it's always been. Today's systematic theology is tomorrow's historical theology, and hopefully today's systematic theologians will be exemplary disciples. The ongoing mission of church leaders is to present the same biblical truths and forms that people will understand today. And so I see both historical and systematic theology as forms of missional theology. And present day missionaries would do well to examine these earlier attempts as the one at Nicaea to communicate the truth of the gospel. So biblical theology traces the plot of the drama of redemption. Systematic theology dives in and explores the significance of particular events. Why was it necessary for Jesus to die? It's a great question. Systematic theology dives in at moments like that in the story to achieve a deeper understanding. And I think the purpose of doctrine is to give us that understanding and then to orient us so that we can act and carry out our part 
in the drama of redemption. And then practical theology, this fourth department, may seem to be batting hermeneutical cleanup, applying to everyday life the wisdom won by these other theological disciplines. But the idea that practical theologians simply apply the results of non-practical interpretation, though common, is, I think, somewhat misleading. Uh, practical theologians, too, today are distancing themselves from this linear model according to which practice always follows theory. And I think a number of practical theologians are coming to see that it's more of a to and fro between theory and practice. Now, whereas systematic theology is attuned to expressing biblical judgments in terms of contemporary thought forms, practical theology focuses on contemporary forms of social life and cultural contexts. It's important to understand the world we live in. Uh, it's the only way really to do theology if it is indeed the application of the Bible to all forms of life. We need to understand the word of God and also the world we live in. But these contexts, the world we live in, though we have to know them, they don't have authority over theology. If you're going to minister to the gospel to people living in the African Great Lakes region, you may need to know Swahili. But Swahili, Swahili doesn't have authority over theology. Language and culture are rather the conditions and the materials we have to work with as we pursue our mission. But practical theology focuses on interpreting God's word and forms of proclamation and practice that fit and that speak into the contemporary context. Practical theology then is also a ministry of understanding. It indicates what discipleship looks like in this place at this time. And so it too makes a vital contribution to this from Bible to theology movement. Okay, reach the conclusion. You'll be glad to know. Paul's goal for the church at Colossae should be the goal of every theological educator that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Learning Christ is the beginning and end, the center and circumference, the matter and energy of theological education. It has to do with the spiritual disciplines associated with discipleship, as well as the academic disciplines uh, associated with the seminary curriculum. What disciples and seminary students have in common is the summons to follow Christ with all one's heart, soul, strength, and mind. My question to myself and us all, perhaps, is whether our theological disciplines are forming disciples. I've suggested that disciples are biblical interpreters, people who know how to follow the words to the original meaning and yet follow the word in our present context so that we bear faithful witness. One important form of biblical interpretation is the commentary, as you know. And I think the best biblical commentaries offer thick descriptions that do justice to all aspects of the text, historical, literary, theological. But there's also a real sense in which the life of the disciple and the local church is the most appropriate and fulsome form of biblical commentary. One writer has says that what we do as the people of God is our interpretation of the Bible. What we do as the people of God is our interpretation of the Bible. It's so important then to get biblical interpretation right. And the ultimate aim of theological education is to help disciples be living commentaries, letters from Christ, commentaries on Christ. And seminaries exist to foster biblical literacy, theological understanding, and as I've tried to highlight in particular, this ability to discern, to discern the voice of God speaking in the scriptures, but also to discern what God is asking of us in our place and time. To have this ability, this discernment, to be this kind of person of understanding I don't think it involves learning a specialization. I think 
pastor theologians have to be a kind of generalist, people who are able to understand all things in light of one thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is wisdom, knowing how to live out one's knowledge of God, knowing how to embody the mind of Christ in, to, as, and for the body of Christ everywhere and at all times. Our task is a wonderful one. We're to form students who can be witnesses to reality because that's what it's all about, what God is doing in Christ to renew all things. That's the real story of what's going on. There's a lot of alternative facts out there. So there you have it, the story of my life, at least up to this point. And if there is a moral, it's that I've learned, or rather am learning, how to teach Christ. That is, how to help others learn Christ. And this is a vocation, not a career. I've had to resist the ever-present temptation to make my work more respectable or popular by buying into the prevailing intellectual or social fashions of the day. I think what this means is before we can make disciples of others, we have to achieve discipleship for ourselves in our own disciplines. This may involve taking up the cross and appearing foolish to others in the guild. But I have five marks of discipleship that help to keep me honest and humble. The Christian educator is first of all one who prays. Christian educators must pray for the grace to model the intellectual virtues, the light to understand the subject matter, and clarity so that their work will be a means of illumination for others. This is a matter of prayer. Secondly, a Christian educator should be a free and virtuous thinker. We should refuse to let the prevailing assumptions about reality set our agendas if those assumptions are reductionist and don't fit in with the oikonomia of God, this drama of redemption. And this takes courage and all the other intellectual virtues. It also takes courage, by the way, to venture outside your own disciplinary territory to ask or to enter into a conversation with someone who is a specialist about something else. But look, we, we, ask, our, we ask our students to do this all the time. They have to try to pull things together between the departments. But be of good cheer. We can do this and be status anxious for nothing or nobody. Third, be a seeker of wisdom. Christian educators are disciples who seek to embody the mind of Christ in their academic discipline first and foremost. And that's how we contribute to wisdom and understanding, not just adding to the inventory of information. Fourth, be an agent of understanding. Christian educators know how to fit whatever they're studying into the bigger picture. And that's when the light begins to dawn, I think, in our students' eyes. We've got to do everything we can not to lose the big theological forest for our disciplinary trees. And then fifth, be a glorifier of God. Approach whatever you study with a ministry rather than a mastery mindset. Because the highest kind of knowledge is not instrumental. Again, this goes against the secular flow. The highest form of knowledge is not about controlling things or mastery. The highest form of knowledge is doxological. It's about celebrating God's creation. And indeed, perhaps our most important work as educators is to teach in such a way that leads our students to want to imitate us in presenting our scholarship and intellectual offering as a loving tribute to God, part and parcel of our daily worship. Thank you.